Tonight's panel discussion brings together an incredibly distinguished uh, guests, and um, it really is friends and family insofar as Jacques and Pierre have worked with Michael Craig Martin, who's sitting at the end of the row, and Hiroshi Sugimoto uh, on a number of occasions. We're both proud that they have uh, exhibited their work here at the Serpentine Gallery. And the, the purpose of tonight's discussion is really about the collaborative process between art and ar architecture, between art and architects, and the way in which these relationships can uh, and do contribute to today's society. Questions of form, utility, purpose, and function have permeated the discourse around architecture since the dawn of modernity. We very much um, work um, uh, in a collaboration. So it's not just one brain or one person who has like a fixed idea and develops that. So we open, we want to open ourselves as much as possible and not only in the field of architects and with architects. And uh, we think that the um, dialogue and the collaboration with artists is much more fruitful. We think it's much more enriching to to, to understand how they see the, the, the life and how we see it and how we can interchange um, and, and have on the perception of life or on those uh, specific topics like um, light in an artificial or in a day condition. The intelligent artist also learns from the collaboration because you always learn a lot to finally lead into a good result. Wei Wei, who is not here with us, we've done so many things together. The stadium is certainly uh, the most amazing piece maybe we've ever done, but, but we've done so many things and some are good, some are less good, but it's, it's, it's a whole history. Uh, one of the things that I discovered about uh, Herzog and Muran when we were working on the tape was that um, I immediately understood what they were talking about because they, the, the, more than any other architect I ever met, they, talk, they thought like artists. They were closer to the way artists think than most architects. There is a very different way of thinking about the world and space and light and all these things. Architects think about these things completely differently in general than artists do. And which is why a collaboration becomes interesting because they bring different things to the table. Mm, I agree. But I mean, for example, would you describe your public works as inherently architectural or rather that they're works made for architecture? Well, I, I never make a, 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 an architectural scaled work without basing it in the character, whatever the architecture is, the character of the architecture. I'm always trying to, I, f I try to find what I'm going to do by looking at the play, at what, where it is. I don't come with an idea. I find an idea through the place. And, and if I, uh, my idea would always be to in somehow enhance the architecture or to reveal something about it that might not otherwise be visible. When we started to do Guts and also the Tate afterwards, this was really quite a new approach to museums as our, our architects, as you say, they didn't like art. They were more in love of their own buildings and of their own features, like all the skylights and all the stuff that they did. But Hiroshi, for example, you wrote once that art resides in, even in things with no artistic intentions. So does that mean, therefore, following on from what Pierre said, that does art reside in architecture? Well, uh, you know, sometimes the artistic in intention is not necessary for for architecture. But uh, no, I, I I do not think so. The, uh, to to me now, I, I practice the architecture as well. So uh, I think the s same spirit, that the artistic spirit is needed for the architecture. I think, and then uh, the spirit has to be descended from some somewhere beyond the human human uh, uh, imagination sometimes it's to me it's always you know how art started we're just beginning to agree now that all four of you are architects but Hiroshi was telling us um, about your your architecture you've, you've built but also about your 
somehow uh, imaginary or ideal museum of this tea, this wonderful description of this intimacy, and that's something which actually a lot of artists mention right now in conversations, this idea that the bigger and bigger the museums get, that maybe a kind of an intimacy in this encounter with art, in these large, large museum and gallery spaces uh, is being lost. So Michael, I was wondering if you've got a kind of a, any architectural projects of a museum you'd like to see built or an imaginary museum? Well, of, of course, I, I do think about architecture a lot, and I do think about the... I have thoughts about uh, designing, so uh, building something myself. I, I have to say that I, I love uh, architectural plans of, uh, you know, the, the plans of buildings and of uh, projects. And I have a plan chest at home where there are dozens of secret floor plans of, pro of unrealized, pro unrealized projects. I think it's very important that everybody opens up his mind and especially creative minds and, and, and um, arch artists gladly are very fascinated by architecture. But um, I think it's an art in itself. It's very difficult to do a great building and um, a painter that not necessarily is a good uh, architect. And uh, um, that's all I can say. So it's a little bit like pop singers who decide to become painters. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Jacques and Pierre, you have built um, many uh, studios for artists. You've built the studio, I think, uh, of Thomas Ruf, Remy Zauk, mm -hmm. uh, and also Baselitz. So it's a medium you... Baselitz, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And they are smart artists because they consult the architect. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, you said about your, your, your project uh, Street Life at Woolwich Arsenal Station. There's something very here interesting about um, the public, about audience. And your quote is that a public work of this kind allows an artist to speak directly to an audience that might never go to a gallery or museum. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering whether you were drawn to architecture because it necessarily engages more than just an art-going public in the same way that this pavilion, because it has no doors, it has no walls, means that the public embrace it in a completely different way than they, they do the building itself. They have to open a door, they have to go through it, they have to orientate themselves. Whereas here you can see it all in one, one, one look, so to speak. Well, I, I do love the idea that uh, when you place uh, uh, artwork or you make an artwork for a public place, particularly when you make something specifically for a public place, you do, uh, you sneak up on people. They, they're not self-conscious about being in the presence of art when, when they see it. So if it's in a train station, it's absolutely perfect. They see it every day and they, they respond to it without ever, they don't think about it in the same way they might if they saw the exact same thing uh, in a museum space where they would feel like it was very rarefied it impacts them much more directly. And that's a very nice thing to be able to do. The opportunities to, to work on an architectural scale for most artists is very limited. There's something amazing, because the, the tiniest architectural scale is gigantic in art scale. Mm. Just the tiniest thing, tiniest building, is an enormous work of art. I don't think that architecture and uh, art can save our s society, but it's questionable what role would it play in the future? And um, what role can it be ideally, or can it ideally play in this kind of tr uh, transforming process? Can it become a more leading role? Well, let's say the good sides of architecture and art as something that is really helping people to go beyond, as Pierre put, uh, um, mentioned it uh, regarding our collaborations with Remy and other artists, to go beyond themselves, to be more interested in other things than just money and just all these other things. One question in relation to that is uh, David Schipperfield um, uses this notion of the common ground, addressing uh, somehow what you've just described. I mean, living in a context where the sort of market economy has, far, has pro produced somehow more and more this idea of the star architect, and obviously the same thing also in the art world. It's this idea of, again, wondering what could be the common ground, which actually explores kind of processes of, of the public's reclaiming also of space uh, for themselves. And that's obviously very inspired by, by Richard Sennett's book. So I was wondering, what kind of are your thoughts about that idea of 
a common ground. Because it sort of brings us back also to the arch architecture topic, no? It's a question of what is there. Coming back to this space, um, this is certainly a place where you can gather and where you can exchange ideas and found mm -hmm. like in a more quiet way to, to have this exchange. And of course, there is not only this one, but it's good as a as um, as an opportunity is good as a uh, when you see this <coughs> park when we walked here this is, was so full of people then you have the stage with the rock this is of course co something completely different and to come here and to be like some protected um, what by the way is somehow architecture its uh, basic func uh, uh, role is like to to protect to shelter and to give this opportunity to, to be sheltered and to be protected from the natural elements like sun or rain. Architecturally, what, when I'm here and talking and sitting here, is incredible how it works. It's open, but on some way it's also enclosed. Mm -hmm. It's like invisible glass windows, uh, glass walls that you don't see. You, you hardly hear the street like there, because this is the, another acoustic or another quality of the cork that it absorbs the sound and having here the hard surface of the of the steel roof it reflects also of course we need some help with the electricity but <laughs> uh, but on the other hand it has this uh, i think basic or elementary function of architecture to to give a space to interact and to be a, a social being I feel very comfortable being here tonight, and I, I feel almost like I, I'm living in the Stone Age. You know, this is a <laughs> cave meeting, and there's no air condition, and we don't need it air conditioning. So why do we have to live in the, 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 the museum-like uh, setting with all sealed and then you know air controlled? We may not need it. This is this is good enough. It's, it's, a, it's a human scale which I like. We should think small now, or this kind of, you know, go back to the the, the beginning of the human culture, and then this is more comfortable to feel feel the air, the wind comes in. If it's cold, it's cold, and our our body can can stun the nature. So I think this is more more like. The, the way we have to to move to move into, I think. So, you know? Michael, pavilions, the new museums. Well, I was just thinking that the the from what we're saying, the pavilion is is like the simplest social space. It's the most basic social space, and who I don't know, Julia, whether it was your idea, whoever's idea it was to to have this project always be pavilions. It's such a wonderful idea. Because if it had, say it had been house, everybody had to, was asked to design a house. How different the whole ethos of this project over all these years would have been. And we who live in London get to see every year a different one. We all have a carry a little history of the ones we've seen, um, com making comparisons, understanding the same thing seen through different eyes. Very, very important thing. Very successful.